Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, welcome back, Hannah. It's a pleasure to have you see, to see you here, here. <laughs> again. Uh, as Marta said, um, I, what, what I'm talking, or I'm going to talk to you today, is about a little bit about the use of com the computational power during Brazilian election, our past election that uh, was in last year, 2018. Uh, this research uh, was done by me in, a collabor in collaboration with another fellow, research fellow called Caio Machado, uh, who is a fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute in London. So we started this research uh, in last October. Uh, we, we, I was here in New York City, uh, actually in New York City, in the state of New York, and he was in London, and it was a very interesting uh, moment to join in a collaborative research uh, separated by the uh, Atlantic Ocean, but, and regarding an object that was far from us, that is a Brazilian elections. But I think we done well. I will talk about uh, this research uh, further. But uh, if, we, if I would change the, the title of this presentation, maybe I will use the, the title, What the Heck is Happening in Brazil? And most of people asking me what is happening in Brazil during this last few months ago, since the Jair Bolsonaro, the last elected president, took uh, office. And yes, it's not easy to explain uh, regarding the, the recent uh, episodes that we had in Brazil, like the burning of the Amazon rainforest that most of you may uh, know about that and heard about that. May, many of you asked me about that. Uh, in addition of that, the, the respectful situation that the Bra Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro had with the uh, Macron's, uh, the uh, President of France uh, wife, uh, answering a message in, in a social uh, media platform uh, saying that the Macron's wife was ugly, and because of that, Macron is attacking our president, uh, who has a pretendly uh, beautiful wife. So, very silly, uh, in a very silly conflict that could be evicted, and we created very bad, a bad situation uh, between Brazil and France. But other uh, episodes, maybe you don't know or didn't hear about, especially because it's maybe a very particular situation that we had in Brazil. For instance, uh, when the representative, the congressman, Jean Willis, who is a LGBTQ community representative, uh, left Brazil uh, in order to protect themselves from menaces and threats that we were receiving of death threats, specifically. And as well, maybe you don't know this other guy that is uh, this guy in a helicopter. He is the uh, Rio de Janeiro's government. And in this episode, uh, he was aboard a helicopter shooting poor communities from the helicopter. And yes, it was a very, very uh, ultra-general situation. And Rio de Janeiro is known by one of the my, most violent states uh, in Brazil. And most, the, most of the, the violence came from the police. Uh, so yes, uh, we have been perceiving the rising of this violence, especially the, the rising of violence from the police. And the last episode, it wasn't a last Sunday. It was a very recent one. Uh, you can see that those cartoons and uh, uh, that man and uh, another uh, AQ. AQ, is it called that? Uh, like a cartoon magazine. So um, uh, a cartoon magazine from Marvel uh, who has this uh, two uh, male guys uh, kissing themselves. And the mayor of Rio de Janeiro decreed that 
all the, the, the books with this image would be uh, harvested or collected and censored. Uh, and it was a clear uh, uh, threat of our freedom of expression and, and it demonstrates the risingness of the censorship among different levels in Brazil. So, what's happening in 2019 now uh, is more uh, the, the top of the, the milk. What do you call that? The fat that it's foam, the foam on the milk uh, in a very complex um, process, political process that we that took place in Brazil. So those were, were photos from June 2013. And this was like our Arab Spring. Uh, we got many riots uh, in different cities of Brazil. And this, those riots started uh, with a uh, bus fare claiming from students uh, we had like a, a bus fare rise uh, at that time, and the, the students went to the streets to protest against this, this bus fare rising, um, increasing. And what happened after that was that many other movements joined the, the, the students' uh, protests and riots, and it became a very a uh, broad um, protesting situation. And there were many different flags uh, rising up, uh, stating for many different, uh, in support for me, many different uh, reasons. And was in that time, in this riot, we could uh, perceive a risingness of some far-right uh, wing movements. And many of these actual far-right uh, wing movements in Brazil uh, was born uh, during these riots in Brazil. So in that time, it was a very, uh, for, to make it crystal clear, in that time, was not a right, far-right wing uh, protest or movement or supported only for this sector, political spectrum. Uh, there was a lot of different actors in uh, protesting this time. Me as well was in the streets protesting. <laughs> and I'm not totally, uh, definitely I'm not a far right uh, political representative. Uh, but uh, as this riot ignited a very um, strong political situation in Brazil. Many of these far-right movements uh, started and took advantage maybe of this situation uh, in Brazil. In the following year, uh, we had elections. And the runoff of this election was uh, between Dilma Rousseff uh, and Aécio Neves, uh, both uh, were representing different political spectrums in Brazil. Uh, Dilma Rousseff from Workers' Party was a left, center-left uh, representative, and Aécio Neves was a center-right uh, representative at that time. And Dilma Rousseff won for a very short uh, room uh, and defeated Aécio Neves in that runoff. Uh, Juma Rousseff took like 51, half or 52 percent of the votes, and uh, ISNF 48 percent of the votes. The, it was uh, not a problem, as in here in the US, you have very short uh, rules that, uh, in elections for uh, as the democracy, the US democracy is known. However, the big problem in this, and, we, and I'm calling this the Brazilian democracy turning point, is that the defeated candidate started to threat uh, the, and challenging that the, the election results was not uh, fair, fair. 
and it starts a process that led to the impeachment of the Dumas Rousseff. And these guys, this, uh, uh, Michel Temer was the vice president of Dilma Rousseff, took office, and he participated on the conspiracy to, the, to impeach Dilma Rousseff in 2016. In addition of that, uh, in Brazil, we have a very bad lawfare process. And this was being reviewed uh, from um, the Intercept. I, I don't know if you all you know the, the Intercept, the, the journal that is run by Glenn Greenwald, who revealed the Edward Snowden uh, 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 files here in the US. So uh, Glenn Greenwald lives in Brazil, and he runs the Intercept of Brazil. And the Intercept Brazil had access to message exchanged between uh, Moro, Judge Moro, that is the car wash operation leader, judge uh, responsible, and the prosecutors are uh, responsible for the car wash uh, operation. And it was, they were, the, it was the monster that were in collusion to accuse the former president Lula da Silva uh, for corruption. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to go to the merit that if Lula da Silva did or no uh, actions of corruption. But what we know so far that, uh, yes, the car wash operation, especially against Lula da Silva, was a non-fair uh, ju judicial prosecution. And it was mo one of the reasons that people think that it was is to take Lula da Silva for out from the le form, last formal election in 2018. What result that and many of uh, people, this is Gerald Walkman, the elite candidate in the last Brazilian elections. Uh, so it was supposed to be the, the next uh, president of Brazil because he, he got a lot of support from many of uh, elite groups in Brazil. And also he took the advantage to Lula da Silva being out of the elections to be the favorite one to win the elections. However, uh, what we saw in Brazilian election that uh, we get, got a polarization of vict uh, sorry, the victor of polarization instead of the uh, 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 president. So we had one of the most polarized elections that we had uh, have been have had ever had in Brazil so far. And as you see uh, in the very left, but actually is the right, 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 right side of the political expression is Jair Bolsonaro, uh, uh, who is the president now. So you do have this spectrum. Um, it's not organized in the, in the political likely, uh, but in the other side, we had um, the Fernando Haddad, who was the candidate for finally appointed by Lula da Silva to be the president uh, running for the Workers' Party. And the runoff was between Fernando Haddad, Workers' Party, and Jair Bolsonaro. But because of this polarization that we had uh, in Brazil, and also this lawfare campaign, and also the support of uh, mass media organizations, uh, against and um, supporting this lawfare process and also this lawfare as it was against the Workers' Party in Brazil, we had a very bad uh, uh, or a very high rejection of the Workers' Party. And finally, uh, Jair Bolsonaro won the, the runoff for, with 65% of them. So I'm starting uh, this and now I have 11 minutes, uh, still have, uh, have 11 minutes to talk with you, was most to Give, give you a background to what's happening in Brazil, which is important to understand how the social media and other uh, factors affected the way uh, Brazilian politics is, is running uh, right now uh, in Brazil. So uh, before the digitalization, we had a, a public opinion formation that was very uh, clear to understand how it uh, how it had been built, uh, especially because we had well-known media actors that intermediate the, the construction of the public opinion in societies. 
But after digitalization and with the, uh, the adoption of the social media instruments, we had more a crowdsourced public opinion. It means the media still has a role to, uh, to, to create and to foster and influence the public opinion. However, people now had the opportunity to share information and, and, and create their own context uh, to and spread it about, uh, spread it out using social media tools. Uh, in Brazil, uh, when we talk about the public sphere after the digitalization and the crowdsourced public opinion, it's important to regard how was our uh, media, mass media, uh, and their classical media before the digitalization. So we always have uh, very concentrated media. Uh, in Brazil, we say seven families control all the, the medias and media uh, channels and how, uh, in the whole territory. It leads for a low media literacy by the population because as you don't have uh, different opinions in conflict, and we, all you see in, on TV or newspapers is taken as a true, uh, people didn't uh, develop this uh, critical uh, view about the information they receive. And in addition, it, le it consequently leads for a low digital media literacy. Uh, it means we have low media literacy overall and we have to deal with another problem that is suddenly some people jump from no connection to always connected experience. It means as the, 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 the people are getting connected so fast and also you have like a gener generational uh, gap. People from uh, old, old uh, people, um, it, it could be a better word for that, but oh, people get are more old that are more old uh, who never had access in internet before uh, have access to a smartphone and start to texting using WhatsApp. So they really don't know they are using internet for that, and so but they join uh, they jump it from the state of no connection at all, no internet at all to. Uh, to use the internet in some uh, very uh, specific uh, and, and very dri driven ways. Uh, in addition of that, um, if we talk about the news consumption, uh, actually, uh, agreeing with, the, my, this, uh, with this assumption that I said about the low media literacy, uh, if we talk about the news consumption uh, in Brazil, and these are, these are data from the digital news report from Reuters, and it's a very interesting report. I, very, I, I encourage you to review this uh, report. Uh, we have the, uh, the, 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 the data that in Brazil, people are likely to trust in any type of news uh, 60, almost 60% 60 in 2008. It means any article, any news that they receive, it, they receive uh, on their phones has the 60% likely to be trusted from that and, and get as true. And in addition of that, we have a lot of use of social media networks and tools uh, for news consumption. As you can see, almost 83% of people uh, in Brazil use WhatsApp, uh, and almost 50% of them use WhatsApp for news, as the news uh, as the main news source for these people. When we talk about the 2000, 2019 data, we had a, 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 a little bit an uh, interesting change on these numbers. So WhatsApp and Facebook is still rising as um, the main uh, source of news for the, for, uh, for the Brazilian people. But the news overall trust uh, well, in, decreased by 11%, maybe because of the outcomes that we had after uh, Brazilian elections that was a very, uh, uh, a very, 
strong uh, information war that took place in, uh, in that time. Um, just complementing this, uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, this article, but this is a, a, a right article from Deb Roy and other authors about the, true, the spread of true and false news online. And what they found is the false news are more likely to be spread and, and it's spread more far than true news. So we created this very, or we have in Brazil, we had in 2018 especially, a very, this very, uh, uh, very favorable uh, environment to uh, false news spreading. So you, we have low media literacy population, we have psychometric, psychometric knowledge used for manipulation, and rising of, of, of polarization environment. So what some people and, and campaign organizing did, they had a very good idea. So we can manipulate this environment uh, using uh, some uh, techniques, especially silly techniques, in a very low cost. So I want to disclaim this. I don't know if I can show this for you, but this was one of the, the most shared video during Brazilian elections. And it carries a baby bottle with a plastic penis uh, in his top. Uh, so um, this was the most, uh, top, most discussed topic during Brazil elections. We didn't discuss the economic is, we didn't discuss it, uh, political reform, we didn't discuss it, health insurance in Brazil during the Brazil election. We discussed it, this baby bottle. So I can show you if you, if you were okay. If it, someone here uh, has a problem with that, I can jump it out. Okay, anyone has a concern? Okay. I will play the video. Uh, oops. Aqui, ó, vocês que votam no PT, essa aqui é uma madeira distribuída na creche. Vai a marca aqui, ó, tá vendo? Distribuída na creche para seu filho. Aí eu vi essa lady. Na habilidade. Vai beber uma madeira na creche com isso aqui, ó, pra combater a homofobia. Tem que botar em Bolsonaro, ó. So, it's clear a, face, a fake baby bottle created to spread misinformation and disinformation in Brazil. And the, the guy is saying that, oh, this was created by uh, uh, Fernando Haddad, the Workers' Party candidate. Uh, it was being, it's going to be distributed to the, the, to the child to, uh, to struggle or to tackle uh, homophobia. And it was a completely lie. But it was a completely lie but after uh, the elections, uh, Avas uh, make a survey to figure how much people uh, still believe that this, that baby bottle was true. And 84% of people is still believing that this baby, uh, baby bottle is true. So it's a very, very big uh, problem. So I'm running out of time. I, have, I still have two minutes, but uh, what we discovered during the Brazilian election that uh, WhatsApp was a very important tool to spread this misinformation, disinformation in Brazil. And it was a movement from the Facebook to WhatsApp, as we had in Brexit and Trump elections. Well, Facebook was the main uh, tool to spread misinformation. Uh, in Brazil, WhatsApp was the main tool. And it was used as a broadcast message not instead of private message in a very clever way. Because uh, WhatsApp has many features that allow people to share a uh, message quickly, uh, many messages went, uh, went viral through WhatsApp. And it's hard to deal with the, the, the WhatsApp uh, problem than it was with Facebook problem, especially because there were some challenges and this, those challenges are the content encryption. So all the content shared in WhatsApp is encrypted. Uh, there is a little context on that. So you can't uh, uh, see in which group or if people are likely or not or know that content uh, in the, the, those groups. So you don't have much more information about the content shared. And in the uh, in, uh, at least the limited user f uh, uh, feedback. So people can't report WhatsApp that 
that content is bad or misinforming or any, anything else. So regarding the situation, uh, me and my uh, cole colleague, colleague uh, Caio Machado, wrote uh, this report. Uh, it was founded by the ITS, my former organization, because, uh, before I, I became a um, Humphrey Fellow. And you can access the re report using that uh, URL, bit.ly uh, slash computational dash power. And basically, I will fly uh, 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 a little to, to get it on time, but basically what we took, we had a automat automatized observation methodology. In, uh, so we got into the groups, political groups that were sharing this political content. We analyzed 110 groups from October 70th to, uh, to, uh, to 2030. It was like the, in the week before the runoff uh, of uh, the elections. And we analyzed almost 27,000 messages. Uh, so what we find uh, in those messages? So we found a very like automated or semi-automated behavior on spreading this uh, message. It means it was not an organic sharing of this message. There was a very organized group behind that was spreading those messages, uh, aiming to disinform population uh, and create uh, and get political advantage on that environment. Uh, we also saw a uh, perceived and find uh, coordinated and symmetrical use among different users uh, in different groups. Uh, so we, we found some, some participants and admins uh, strategically spread it and distributed among the groups and also the, the admins and, and, and participants. So uh, I can talk more with you how we, we find uh, that uh, information after we can move to the uh, Q&A and get it more clear if you are interested on this uh, results. But closing the, 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 my presentation, I want to uh, highlight limits and challenges that we had in this research, especially because we are dealing uh, with WhatsApp groups. WhatsApp groups are a kind of quasi-public uh, environment. So we can't get into uh, WhatsApp groups if you are not invited or if, they are, uh, if, the, or if we have a web link that gets access to us to that groups. So we can't create a very representative uh, sample to understand uh, that environment. So what we had with these findings was a very specific particular and regarding only the groups we had access. Uh, we had also limited tools. We don't have very strong tools to do this anal analysis. It was a kind of tool that we created for this purpose in that time. And also we have privacy and ethical concerns. So as we are in the uh, uh, WhatsApp groups and people doesn't know that we are there, uh, we, are not, we are not clear if you are um, uh, breaking any rule about the privacy of the people uh, and as people are not aware that we're watching that we're, they are talking about, uh, we were kind of wicked. Uh, with this uh, situation. Uh, I was going to talk about the use of WhatsApp and microtech in India, but I can talk uh, further. But what the, those final slides uh, bring uh, in addition of this discussion is that uh, it's important to, when we do this kind of research about misinformation, disinformation campaigns and the use of uh, computational power uh, for this purpose is important regard the environment and understand uh, how the polarization is driving the society on that time. So we, 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 we have perceiving, we have been perceiving that the polarization is the, one of the most important uh, reasons to this kind of campaign getting success. So it's not about the technological uh, apparatus to make this campaign get uh, uh, being successful, but uh, the environment, the political environment, and how polarized, polarized, polarized it, it, it is, is 
much better is a much better factor to understand how this misinformation, disinformation um, campaigns are successful. So thank you. Ah, so uh, finally, uh, just a takeaway for you uh, is a movie recommendation. I strongly, uh, if you're more, in, if you're interested in this topic, uh, watch The Great Hack. It's 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 available on Netflix platform. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting movie and how some organizations uh, like Cambridge Analytica are using psychometrics to manipulate uh, democratic process. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks so much for having me. So for your first question, Max, um, Telegram have uh, almost the same modus operandi of WhatsApp. And I think there's, it's not about the tool itself, uh, but how uh, popular uh, it is in a society. For example, WhatsApp in Brazil uh, is the most used private message ever. And regarding the word uh, context, um, WhatsApp is the second largest market. Uh, Bra Brazil is the second largest market for WhatsApp. Uh, only uh, the, the India is the first one. Um, with almost 120 million. Probably Telegram is more popular in Russia because it's a Russian uh, app. So I think all the concerns that we have about the use of the WhatsApp and this strategic use to spread misinformation that I demonstrated during my presentation also can take place uh, through Telegram. It's not, uh, there is no uh, other reason that it didn't could be. So uh, about the, 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 your uh, second question. Uh, you were talking about uh, the um, alternative media sources? No, I mean, uh, generally, does the power try to uh, block the communication in social media? Because the uh, Russian government tried to block Telegram on the territory of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, Russian government like, put people to jail for like, anti-governmental causes. And I mean, does this happen in Brazil? Not. And if not, how can you explain why power doesn't use it? Mm -hmm. So in Brazil, it, it doesn't have for these reasons. So uh, we don't have any app block uh, by the content people are sharing in, on those uh, social apps. However, we had, I think, four or five WhatsApp blocks 
do since 2015 uh, to now. That was because WhatsApp refused to share private information from uh, its users to uh, judges that were in a prosecution or in an investigation, and they wanted the, the WhatsApp to share the, those data. So in our internet uh, law in Brazil, uh, we had an article that was misinterpreted and judges take, took decisions about that, saying, if WhatsApp uh, don't give the information I want, I will block the app. So uh, we, we had WhatsApp block uh, several times by this reason, but not, never about the content that people are sharing. And regarding this power uh, unbalance, maybe, uh, that you were uh, talking about and this difference in Russia and, and Brazil. This same internet law that we have guarantee uh, some basic right, fundamental rights for internet users in Brazil that allow them to have th their freedom of expression protected. Maybe in Russia you don't have that, and because of that, many arbitrary decisions by the government could be taken uh, and making users, uh, internet users, uh, out of service or use the app based on that. I think uh, one of the most uh, interesting things that we have in Brazil and in comparison with Russia regarding this issue is our internet view of rights uh, that we call that the Marco Civil the Internet. Please. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed the presentation. And I'm very interested in the, uh, well, read the paper because I think, you know, the automated part of it, you know, it's really important to understand this. Mm -hmm. what... We have a Portuguese version, so you can. All right, well, good. <laughs> you know, it's, it's automated, and you know, even if it's not automated, it's amazing how quickly these things spread. So the question I have is, you know, tests measure of trust, and trust seems to be connected to judgments about a kind of a binary, the way that you're framing it, of, of the binary of truth or falsity of a, a thing, like a, a, a flame or an image, or all sorts of things come over WhatsApp, right? And I'm wondering whether, I, I think that's great to think about trust in those terms, but it seems to me to be um, maybe a false binary here of truth and falsity because a lot of the power of WhatsApp and some of these other apps is not that they're true or false, but that they're sensational, that they're visceral, they're powerful, they're in, the image is there, it's intense, and there's no contextualization. I mean, part of this is you don't know what the events were that led up to it. You don't know how common it is. You don't know if this was something that was done ironically. You don't know what the motivations are. You, know, you don't know enough, and so you can look at that as how a lot of the uh, these images come over YouTube and so on when you know before the election, for example, powerful images of the drug traffic, you know, moving it up with their high-powered AK-47s and swearing and talking about what they're going to do to this, that, and the other. As soon as that starts circulating, it takes on a life of its own. It's true because it happened, but its meaning is politically ambiguous, and you can draw from it what you will. So I'm wondering, the truth or falsity part of it, I'm a little skeptical of, and it seems to me that the impactfulness of these images don't easily reduce themselves to truth or falsity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I recommend uh, the reading of these, about this question, the, this, uh, size and article. I think misinformation and disinformation uh, is the most challenging topic for the modern uh, democracies. Uh, so, and it's challenging, especially because it's hard to, to define what's false and what's true, because some information could be partially true 
or partially false, false, uh, or it can be bringing from the decontextualized situation. And what this um, article says that when uh, Debra Roy stated that the false information spread fastly and broadly than the true information, it, it is be especially because most of the time false information uh, or partially false information are created in aiming in to be uh, to pretend be true and pretend be uh, emer an emergency or pretend to be an exclusive exclusive information so when people receive that information what they they realize that oh my god it's happening and before they can uh, think if it could be true or false, uh, they share it, saying, oh my God, I need to tell for my fellows, uh, for, my, for, for my friends, for my family, that is, it's happening now and it's an emergency. So this spreads by this reason. However, what we perceive it and what we, my, our research want to bring up that there are also organized groups and professionals that think uh, the, 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 the news or th think to spread information in this way. So they are willingly creating uh, news and articles using this partially true information, so you don't have a, a, a sort of accuracy if it's false or not, and embedding it in a message that is creating an emergency for the, for the receiver, and so they can make it spread very, very uh, fast. And when we talk about uh, misinformation, disinformation, uh, and its impact, in democracy, uh, it's important to understand which groups of interests are inside of this environment and also what, are, what is the role of they are playing in spread this uh, information. I don't know if I uh, completely answered, but yes. Yeah, Sorry, can you repeat the last one, uh, Hannah? First so, one the media yeah, groups. okay. And second one about user participation in politics. User participation in politics. Yes, it's political politics. Are they joining or staying apart? Okay, I don't. Did, I, 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 I thought that I understood, but I, I, I didn't realize that you were asking in a more broad way. Um, about the media literacy. Um, yes, I think. One of the, the most important um, actions to be addressed to fight against this, uh, this phenomena uh, in democratic so societies is uh, increase the role of media literacy uh, of the population. Uh, we are talking about this during uh, many other talks we had regarding this research and others uh, when I was in the Institute for Technology in Society. We also created a tool 
to teach people to understand how robots operate in social media. It's called uh, Bot Hunter. Um, we, uh, we have this concern to, to media literacy increasing uh, in democratic societies. However, when we talk about media literacy, uh, we have two important issues to take into account. One is media literacy uh, actions uh, take very long to, to get effect. So it means if we start a very broad, strong action uh, addressing media literacy in democratic society, uh, we, will, we, will, we will perceive the, 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 the outcomes maybe in 10 years uh, or 15 years. And these uh, democra democracy manipulations are uh, happening right now. Um, so this is a, an issue. Another issue is uh, many times media literacy actions are used to blame the receiver by the problem that is happening. It means that uh, it's happening because people in Brazil don't, don't know how to deal with WhatsApp and information. So the problem of, uh, is, uh, is the problem is the Brazilian internet users, not people that taking advantage of this misinformation, disinformation campaign. So the media literacy, I think it is a very important uh, issue, but it doesn't have to take uh, as a silver bullet uh, solution. Please. Hi, Marcos, it was a wonderful presentation. I would like to just uh, know a little bit about, uh, as you told in one line, that there was micro targeting. Ah, okay, okay. okay. So, um, exactly what uh, you meant by it and what was it? Because uh, there was a lot of uh, issues discussed in the last election uh, while uh, social media was used uh, to the maximum. Uh, so, uh, I, I would like to know your observations on that. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you for, for asking that, because I was thrilled to, 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 to comment that. Uh, how much time do we have? Do you have? About seven minutes. OK. Um, so in Brazil, we have this very clever. And in the, the end, it, despite it was um, very unfair and and maybe breaking the rules during the elections. Uh, they use the WhatsApp in a very clever way, and they, they have a very successful result outcome that they elected the following president in Brazil. And we, after, discovered that some groups created some applications to track users' behavior in WhatsApp by their phone numbers. And was not an official applic application. WhatsApp as well doesn't have an API, it means. WhatsApp doesn't have an official interface where people can uh, uh, extend the, the, WhatsApp, the app resources, as Facebook is. I don't know if you are uh, knowledgeable about this 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 kind of language that I'm using, but API basically is a, a, a door that apps open to other users, created all, other apps, and extend the features for, of uh, that app. WhatsApp doesn't have this. Uh, WhatsApp it's a, a very single tone uh, app, and it doesn't offer any API, any extension. However, some groups, as in Brazil use it uh, reverse engineering to inject information and manipulate uh, information through uh, WhatsApp. And they create apps, apps for, for that. And there are no official apps, uh, but they use it. And uh, in India, what we heard was uh, some groups uh, could be able to escalate this uh, um, re 
reverse engineering on WhatsApp and create a big data map of many different WhatsApp users in India. I don't know how uh, you are introduced a uh, user to know about micro-targeting. Do you know what micro-targeting is? So micro-targeting uh, is a marketing technique uh, that some companies use it to address an information or an adver advertising rightly uh, to have more likely people to consume that based on personal data information. M many of you maybe had uh, this sense that you uh, search for something or are looking for a travel to uh, some place or some product and after that you get a target advertising saying, oh, you want to go to Bahamas? Okay, you have uh, some discounts if you buy now. So we realize, oh my God, how they know that? This is a kind of micro-targeting micro technique. So based on your uh, history, uh, browsing history and other information like your age, like your place uh, of living, they can, can address these advertisements. So uh, in Facebook, it's very common because Facebook, the, 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 the product Facebook sells is the personal data information of the, their users. But they don't sell the, the raw data. They sell the micro-targeting advertising. So when you create an advertising in face, on Facebook, uh, you can choose, oh, I want this advertising to be reached for people between 30 and 35 years old, who lives in Syracuse, and whatever. So they, people can use the pl uh, Facebook platform to address this advertising. On the other hand, WhatsApp doesn't have this micro-targeting advertising platform. So you can't do that as an official product of WhatsApp. However, in a very clever way, some groups uh, in India used some personal information from, from people. And in India, also during election, you can claim uh, information of policy, uh, policy benefiters. Benefiters? People who is benefited by any policy, beneficiaries. Uh, policy beneficiaries, you, during the elections, you can reclaim this information to the state. So you can have a list of people uh, who was benefic benefited uh, by some policy or something. What they do is they created a, a side platform, not official platform, using reverse engineering to mix this, those data uh, with some other personal information they could harvest from WhatsApp application. And they could use WhatsApp to micro-target people that, who started to receive messages about the, the benefits they got from the, 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 the party that was running the, the, the in charge at that time. So uh, it was a very interesting way they, they use it. And as, as, uh, as in addition to that, despite it was not official and was not uh, regulated by the platform, I must confess that uh, uh, in India they do the very interesting uh, work. Not, I agree with that. I, I, I don't know if I agree or not with that, but in a, in a marketing perspective, in an electoral uh, strategy perspective, it was a very clever action in, in the way to use WhatsApp for that, political propaganda. Thank you very much, Marco. I think that's a good spot to end. Thanks so much.